Hey class, welcome to another lecture, our second in a series of a general introduction to uh, psychology, sociology, and anthropology. Uh, it's Mr. Wiskin again, obviously, and in this case we're going to give a brief introduction to sociology, sort of what it is, some of the key terms surrounding sociology, uh, as well as some of the influential thinkers and a lot of the theories that are really important uh, to sociology. So without further ado, let's get started um, looking at you know, what is sociology at its very core? And basically, sociology is, how do you put it lightly? It's just a very ambitious undertaking. Um, sociologists from the, you know, the, the 19th century onward tried to look at how society functions. Um, ology, the word being the study of, and socio, society. So they want to know how society functions. And like it says here with this general um, term, you know, so sociology looks at the development and structure of human society, uh, its institutions, for example, and tries to figure out how society works and society functions. So, you know, probably one of the main concerns of sociology is to explain uh, why members of some groups behave differently than members of other groups. So, you know, for example, um, these can be, you know, why do why does the U.S. have more crime than Canada, or why is I don't know British Columbia's crime rate higher than Newfoundland? Uh, why are there fewer women in certain professions? So, literally any question about society is trying to be answered by sociologists. So there's a ton of opportunity to study in sociology and understand how the world works, and basically. You know, another way you could look at it is it also sociology studies social behavior and social relationships. You know, it examines the effects of society and group members on human behavior. So not only how do humans affect society, uh, but how are humans affected by society, as well as, you know, people's perceptions of their environment and everything like that. So, you know, it may seem as though I'm saying that, you know, sociology is 100 percent or sociologists believe that human behavior is 100% defined by uh, society. But, you know, sociologists really never argue that behavior is fully determined by the common experiences. Um, so just because, you know, we live in, uh, you know, Markham, Unionville, uh, Richmond Hill area, doesn't mean that we're all going to turn out the same. Um, you know, sociologists, you know, they understand and expect that people can and, and they do make choices um, for themselves, hence why we all turn out differently. But at the core, sociologists do believe that social environments, uh, you know, which often are different in different groups, you can't ignore that when looking at human behavior. So as a social science, and again, social science in general of trying to figure out uh, society and everything that goes along with being human, uh, the sociologist aspect really tries to look at the impact society has on humans and how we understand society. So Basically, in a little bit more depth, anything, like I said, dealing with um, how groups are structured, this could be as simple as, you know, sociologists have examined things from uh, major Fortune 500 companies, uh, companies like Apple, uh, computers and things, how they're structured, and they want to know as well how, for example, uh, the local chapter of Hell's Angels is structured. So they want to look at how these structures of groups in different organizations and how really people interact. They're interested in social hierarchies. They're interested in relationships, both you know, um, intimate relationships such as uh, husband and wife, um, or any sort of married couple. They're interested in those relationships. They're interested in relationships between friends, relationships of coworkers, uh, relationships of power and powerlessness. So I seem to be rambling here, but I really can't stress the point enough that. Sociologists really try to look at anything and everything that has to do with how humans interact in these, um, in this society, and you know, like I said, it's an incredibly ambitious undertaking, but something that sociologists like to take um, a challenge at and try to figure out how society works. So, basically, their subject matter. If you live in a society, sociologists will study you. <laughs> will study you. So. That's really the broad scope of what they have. And one of the key things here is um, sort of the roles we play. So sociologists um, are very interested in the roles human, humans play in society. And 
you know, social scientists sort of refer to this as status, sort of our position within an institution. Um, so, for example, let's take, um, let's go with something we're all familiar with, like a high school. So at any high school, we'll take, uh, we'll take my high school, Markville, why not? There are many positions at Markville. You know, you have teachers, you have students, you have um, educational assistants, you have guidance counselors, you have vice principals, you have principals, you have superintendents, uh, you have directors of education. And even in, you know, an institution like school, there are a ton of different hierarchies and we play all different roles. And our position within that is different, whereas you may have, uh, you know, sort of near the top with the person with the most status and uh, the most power would be someone like a superintendent. Uh, the superintendent would then, um, right below that, there'd be sort of the principals at every school and below the principal would be the vice principal. And, you know, uh, below the vice principals would be... Um, you know, teachers with some power and authority, and below that, unfortunately, uh, students. But its roles are not just about hierarchies as, you know, uh, which is the most powerful and who is, you know, the least powerful, but roles are also sort of identities, and for sociologists, roles are also identities that we take on. As a student, whether you're aware of it or not, you have a different role um, to take on. And even within students themselves, for example, there are a lot of different hierarchies, um, or sorry, a lot of different roles that people play. Like, for example, um, you know, a school like Unionville, for example, which is known as an art school, will have sort of people will take on different roles in that art school, uh, being more towards the, the humanities and um, the humanities, drama, and arts. Uh, whereas a student, at, for example, Bill Crothers would take on the identity of more of a, an athletic um, role. And it sort of fit in with that mold of those types of schools. Uh, I'm trying to think of other specialized schools. I know Alexander McKenzie's a, a specialized school uh, for the arts. Um, you know, I can't think of any off the top of my head. But you can see within different, um, you know, different uh, schools there are different roles, and we play them all. Even within an individual school, you'll have you know sort of cliques. Sociologists would look at that as roles. You know, you'd have um, sort of the the comp I don't know, for lack of politically correct terms, you know, you'd have like the computer geeks, the jocks, um, uh, the drama club, uh, you know, the popular, the, the cool kids, the popular, you know, the unpopular. So we have a lot of different roles in society. And again, I'm giving a lot of examples because sociology and its um, spectrum is absolutely huge. So within those actual roles, another important term dealing with society is hierarchy. So people take on different roles, and like I sort of alluded to earlier, um, you know, there's different hierarchies or different rankings within any particular environment based on what authority and power you have. So, you know, each position or role requires sort of a certain type of expertise, which is valued sort of by society. So, for example, if we take a look at, um, you know, let's take a look at Apple a few years ago. Um, the person with the most uh, power and authority within Apple, the company, would obviously have been Steve Jobs as the CEO. And, you know, he's sort of valued because he has a certain type of expertise, the ability to manage a company and think of all these creative ideas. So in the hierarchy of Apple, you know, Steve Jobs would sort of be at the top. Um, and what's also interesting about these hierarchies, and it actually goes into roles as well, um, you know, in order to distinguish between these roles, people are sort of expected to dress and act in a certain way. If we go back to, um, hi, let's go back to the high school example because it's something that's most pertinent to you guys. Um, you know, teachers just can't, although, you know, you see a lot of students come around in, you know, their sweatpants, for example, in a sweatshirt, although incredibly comfortable uh, because of the roles that teachers take on in society, they're expected to dress and act in a certain way. So, you know, I come, I don't come to school in, in sweatpants and a sweatshirt and, you know, my, my, um, my comfortable slippers, no matter how comfortable that would be. You know, I come in a shirt and tie and, and dress shoes because I'm expected to act in that certain way in that hierarchy. Now, what's really cool, too, is a lot of these roles and hierarchies are interchangeable. You know, on any given day, uh, we can play many different roles in society. You know, um, for example, uh, a parent, you know, they can, one person, you know, let's take a, a mother, for example. Uh, in the morning, her, her role in society is as of a parent, and she gets her kid off to school. And she's tired, but then she becomes, um, you know, her second role is she's a vice president of a major company. So she takes on a role of extreme power. Um, 
you know, and she knows what she's doing, but maybe she comes home and unfortunately is in a verbally, you know, abusive relationship and her power in, in the marriage is, is low. So we all take on a lot of different roles at different times. Um, say again, for example, maybe um, in a certain classroom, you're very, very shy, you don't like talking. So you take on the role of the quiet kid, but then, you know, you're very outgoing in the role of, you're the, you're the captain of the local soccer team. So in that role, you're much more extroverted and you're more outgoing. So we all take on different roles at different times in society. And another few key terms that sociologists use are rules, uh, norms, and values. And within these hierarchies and within these roles, there are certain values, certain norms, and certain rules that exist in uh, society. So for example, uh, values, you know, every society carries with it a system of values, something that they believe in, something that is core to their society. So a couple of values and sets of beliefs, for example, if we take a look at something broad uh, like Canada, you know, our values of Canada tend to be, in its broadest sense, uh, democracy. We're proud of, of being a democracy as well as we're proud of uh, being very multicultural. So those would be a couple of Canadian values that we would take on. And I'm sure uh, even at the family level, different family levels have different values. Um, for example, some families value teenage independence, letting teenagers make decisions and uh, helping out around the house, whereas other families may be much more authoritarian. And, uh, you know, you may have, uh, you know, their values are you don't talk back to your parents and you do exactly as the parents say. So different, you know, social institutions have different, uh, val different values. Also norms uh, going along with roles are, you know, a, a standard set of behavior. Uh, which you're supposed to practice. Um, for example, uh, let's go with religion as a, a social institution. For example, Catholic priests are expected to be celibate. And that's sort of the norm we put on society. Um, let me think of another few examples. Um, if we think of, let's go with the social institution of modeling, for example. You know, the norm of models is that, uh, you know, women have to be, you know, super skinny, blonde hair, uh, whereas men have to... I don't know, if you look at the Abercrombie and Finch, if you're going to be a model, most likely you need six-pack abdomen. So there are certain norms that go along with all these different roles. And what's your standard behavior for the job? Even going back to teaching, there are certain standards um, that teachers have to uphold. You know, uh, don't hit this, you know, one standard, actually, let's use teaching as an example. One of the norms 40 years ago was that, you know, teachers would be allowed to physically hit students if they got out of line. Uh, you know, bring back the strap and bam. Uh, you know, smack that kid who's out of line. But now the norm is that teachers don't lay a hand on students, for example. So norms and values often change too, uh, which is also another fascinating aspect of sociology. As you can tell, I quite enjoy the subject, so I get very uh, animated when talking about this. So uh, another one are rules. These are developed by cultures, you know, based on their system of values. These rules can be, um, let's go with the, uh, the sociology of uh, driving. These rules can be, you know, actually instituted in law that if you go above uh, the speed limit, you will have, um, you know, you will get a, a ticket or if you're 50 kilometers over the speed limit in Ontario, uh, you know, you get your car towed and, and taken away. So that's an example of some rules or also there are unwritten rules of the road. You know, you, um, you know, the left lane is for passing. So if you're going to drive slow or around the speed limit, you stay in the right lane. So there, there are, you know, sort of, sort of rules and, and, um, that are both written and unwritten in society. And speaking of rules, um, you know, deviance is sort of any behavior that's sort of different from the social norm. It could be, uh, you know, for example, um, if we look at men's roles in society, in the 1950s and 60s, you know, there was very, very strict sort of definition of a man. Uh, the breadwinner of the family makes a lot of money. Um, whereas now it's, you know, more acceptable for guys to be, uh, a little bit more metrosexual. Um, I remember that was sort of big when I was going in, in through high school is that a lot of guys started wearing uh, nail polish on their fingers to show, I guess their allegiance to, you know, punk rock was a big one back in the day. So guys started to do that. So deviance could be something as simple as, you know, acting sort of different, um, as like a man should, or it could be something obviously as breaking the law, you know, it's, one of the written rules of society is you do not murder others. So deviants um, can range from simple eccentricities that actually disrupts society and could cause considerable harm. So deviants, is, there's a whole spectrum of stuff. And Emile Durkheim, a famous sociologist who um, we'll talk about him a little bit later, 
who brought her out sort of the, the functionalist um, view of sociology, says, you know, about deviance, we must not say that an action shocks the common conscience because it's criminal, 